Hi, this is 3rd District City Councilman Darius Brown. In recognition of this month, the month of February, being Black History Month, I've asked Dr. Henry Smith, the Deputy Secretary of Delaware's Department of Health and Social Services, to join me as a history maker lecturer at Thomas Edison Charter School in the 3rd District. I hope you enjoy Dr. Smith. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you for that introduction. Chandra is her name, right? Sandra, thank you. I'll get it right before I leave today. But thank you so much. Uh, the uh, bio that she offered of me, uh, that was a bio that was accurate up until February of 2009. I did serve as secretary of the Delaware Children's Department, where we worked on behalf of children in the state. Uh, I currently serve as deputy secretary for Delaware's largest cabinet agency, and that is the Department of Health and Social Services. And um, when I spoke with Councilman Brown, you know, he said that you guys might have some interest in knowing a little bit about what we do in the Department of Health and Social Services. But the Department of Health and Social Services is a department that's significantly larger than the Children's Department. Whereas the Children's Department had um, staff of about 1,300, we employ about 5,000. Whereas the Children's Department had a budget of about $178 million, we have a budget of $2.3 billion. And um, it's, a, it's a big job. <laughs> but as your principal noted, it's something that all of you can aspire to do, but really your aspiration should exceed even those. Um, Darius said that you want to know a little bit about what I do. What, what is it that you guys want to know about what I do or a little bit about me? Anybody? Yes. I love what I do. I love what I do. Um, when I was thinking about coming to talk to you, um, I was talking with my wife and I, I wanted to talk a little bit about success because in terms of what I do now, in terms of what the councilman does, folks look at us as being successful and I want to talk a little bit about success. And in doing that, yes ma'am? Uh, no, I'll do more, I'll more Okay. I'll talk a little bit about how I got to where I am. I won't take too long to do that because I can remember I was in a classroom um, when I was roughly your age, um, but I was about 15 years old. I'm originally from a little community outside of Charleston, South Carolina. It's a little rural community. It's called Ten Mile. Didn't have paved roads, um, dirt roads, and we went to schools that weren't terribly challenging certainly not nearly as challenging as the school that you guys currently attend. And I can remember back in 1962, I was sitting in a classroom, and over the loudspeaker came this call from the principal's office for me to come on down. Well, I don't know what it is like today, but back in those days when you were called to the principal's office, it meant that you were in trouble, right? It meant that, meant that you were in trouble. And so clearly I thought that I was in trouble and I was shivering going down the hallways to the principal's office. And got to the principal's office and as I walked in, my feelings went from apprehension, concern, to just outright fear. Because guess what I saw? Peeking in the door, I saw a white man. I said, oh yeah, that's exactly what I said. Because in 1962, for a white man to have been in my school, it meant that I was in deep trouble, okay? But interestingly enough, um, this white man was not there to put me in trouble, and nor was I called to the principal's office because I was in trouble. I was called to the principal's office because someone was expressing a deep interest in my success. And I want to talk to you, that's why I want to talk to you a little bit more about success. A deep interest in my success. There were some folks who thought that I had abilities and that those abilities were being stunted or not being fully developed because we were in such poor schools. The schools were segregated. There were schools for black kids. There were schools for white kids. The schools for white kids were challenging, interesting. The schools for black kids were not nearly as challenging. And so I was invited to participate in a program called Project STEP, Student Transfer Enlightenment Program, where I, along with 99 other black kids, 
from various states across the south we came north to participate in schools in the north i ended up in a private boys school on long island called the wheatley school and here i was ninth grade some of you are eighth grade how many of you are in the eighth grade all right so i was a year ahead of you and while i was at Jenny Moore and Lang in South Carolina, I was a straight A student. And here I came to the Wheatley School and they gave me all of these materials in the classroom that I was supposed to take. And again, apprehension, fear, and just outright terror. I had never seen this stuff before. I said, my Lord, what am I gonna do? But again, I was fortunate in that some people, other people, had an interest in my success. They exhibited a care. And a lot of people surrounded me, and they tutored me. Not five days a week, seven days a week, because I had to really hustle to make sure that I could get up to snuff. And it was a big hustle. But I finished and went on to college in Schenectady. Schenectady, New York, where I received my undergraduate degree. Um, worked for a while as an engineer. Found out that I really didn't like engineering, even though it paid well. I can remember when I got my first job in 1969, my first professional job in 1969. I was being paid $12,000 a year. I said, wow. <laughs> $12,000 in 1969 was a big salary. Actually, $12,000 in 1969 was more money than my father and my mother were making combined. And so at that point, they thought that I was successful. I went on from that position and held several other positions um, in the course of my career, ending up where I am now as the chief operating officer for Delaware's largest state agency. And some people consider that to be extremely su successful. Let me ask you this, how many of you want to be successful? I'm glad to see, how many of you don't want to be successful? And that's even more redeeming. So all of you want to be successful, tell me what you think success is. Yes, what do you think success is? Do you have a microphone? She's going to tell us what she thinks success is. Hard work. Hard work. Yes. Accomplishing your goals. Accomplishing your goals. I'm leaving there. Getting to where you want to in life. Pardon me? Getting to where you want to in life. Getting to where you want to in life. Yes. Being able to achieve something. Well, I think it is when you, when you do something that you love and you have like you made a history with it. So she's just doing something that you love and when you make history with it. Over here. Following your dreams. Following your dreams. My success would be to get my doctor's degree. Oh, wow. Fantastic. Great. Okay, we're going to get one more. In the back here. What do you think success is? Going to college. Okay. Great, great answers. All of those things, in one sense or another, are what I would call aspects of success. Um, as I said, right now, a lot of people look at what I do um, and they say, you know, you're successful. And when they think about what I do, they think about the responsibilities I have and they think about um, my compensation, right? And that's success. But let me tell you another little story. Prior to having this current position, I held other positions where I had status within the organization. There was one that I can remember where I served as vice president for a university. And um, 
This was back in 1986. 1986, I was making it in this position about $78,000 a year, so I was making more money, had status within the organization, started that position in October of 2006. December 2006, I quit the job. I said, oh Lord, I quit the job. That's exactly what my mother said, oh Lord. Did you quit that job making $78,000 a year? Yes, I quit that job making $78,000 a year and went for another year homeless. I was homeless. I was also going through a divorce. Yeah. Um, now, I was not a different person. I was not a different person, but I wasn't making the money. I didn't have the job. I didn't have the status. Was I less successful? Yes. Said so, no. yes. No. 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 All right. Who believes that I was less successful? All right. Let's let's see why you guys think I was less successful. Anybody got a mic over here? No, some over here said less successful. I think you was less successful because, um, don't, don't worry, I'll be all right. Because, <laughs> um, um, like you quit the job, like you stopped giving up and all that. Because I, when I stopped working, I gave up, I was less successful. All right, gentlemen back here, why do you think I was less successful? Because you had to spend the money. Split the money. Because I, I gave up the money? Okay. You had to split the money. I had this with, with the wife. Well, I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, man, it sounds like you had some experience in this, but you don't I know. <laughs> I to talk to you later about it. Okay, one more on who thinks that I was less successful. I think you were less successful because you didn't have no house and you was getting divorced and all that. Okay. Now, let me get some folks who don't agree, who believe that I wasn't less successful. Let me start with this young lady here because she had a question for me. Right here. Uh, I think, no, here's your mic. I think you weren't less successful because you didn't give up on yourself as a person. Like you said, you didn't change. Like, the only thing that changed was your outside. Like, inside you were still the same person. So I don't think you were less successful. All right. And I, I need you to make sure when you hold the mic, please keep, keep the mic, because what you said was very important, and people need to hear that, because there's somebody in here today who may be thinking about giving up on something, and they need to hear what you say. Hold that mic up close so people can hear every, if you watch the speaker, he holds that microphone to make sure you hear every word, because he is going to say something today that's going to touch somebody's life today, and you need to hear it. And the words you hear from each other are going to inspire you and motivate you. So please hold that microphone up so we can hear you. You might be young, but we can still learn from you. Okay? Get a professor the microphone there, please. Uh, I think you were not less successful because even though you were getting a divorce and everything, you, you did what you had to do, and you worked hard to get to where you are today. Yeah. Can we get one more defender? <laughs> anybody else? Anybody else for? And you know what's great? This ties in because I know in eighth grade we've been doing pro and con. They've been doing two sides of an argument. So I think this ties right in with that. So is there anybody else who's a pro on why um, he was more successful? To our, our speaker, although he may have had some setbacks, right? He still was thinking about a comeback. And so I need to know, is there anybody else who agrees that just because he had some setbacks, that he was still successful? One more person. Preferably one of you young people who've been working on pros and cons. <laughs> All right, here's up front. Here, right here. Can that me? Um, I think you were more successful because... I think, you were, <laughs> I think you were more successful because you learned from your mistakes and from going through your trials. And 
once you go through your trials and tribulations, you learn more and you have more knowledge and more things, so now you're more successful. Amen, amen. Thank you. Amen, Reverend. Okay, one, one, one more, one more. Um, I say that, um... What up? You might just say, hold um, the mic up. <laughs> Sorry. Um, even though you quit that job, you still make more money than, than you do now, so you reach the higher goal than what you did before. Okay, thank you. All right. Well, I'm glad you guys are having these discussions on pros and cons. One of the things that you'll probably get out of your uh, discussions on pros and cons is that issues are best understood when you understand the context. Now, let me tell you what I mean by context. It's all of the circumstances surrounding decisions that we make. Let me tell you why I quit that job. I had a staff, I was vice president for development, and I had a staff, the wife of the president, and I won't name the institution, so I won't name the president, was, in my estimation, abusive to some of my staff. So much so that she wanted to kick them out of office space that they had, because she wanted to occupy the office space for one of her interests. Now that would have been okay, except when I went in to have the discussion with the president. Here was what the president told me, and the president was also from South Carolina. Here's what the president told me. He said, Henry, don't worry about them. He said, it's me and you. They're just functionaries. Now, you know what a functionary is? Just somebody who you order around to do things, okay? Well, I don't believe that people are put on this earth just to be ordered around to do things. And so I said, this is not the place for me. But nevertheless, I still had responsibilities. At the time, I had three children. I also had a PhD. And even though I could not get a full-time job, I had a rake and a shovel. I raked leaves, I shoveled snow. For 13 months, I did those things to make sure that my three children would not suffer adverse consequences of a decision that I was compelled to make. So I made that decision, and some of you are right. I did not simply stay down kept looking, and consequently, here's where I am. But let me just try to give you this context for my view of success. For me, success isn't just about material things. In fact, more often than not, it's secondary. We have a lot of people who have lots of material things who are really miserable people. They have no sense of personal self-fulfillment. A critical dimension of self, um, of success, at least for me, are the experiences that I was trying to share with you. Individuals who saw something in me. Individuals who are interested in cultivating those things within me. Individuals who were concerned about me taking advantage of opportunities available to me to grow. Individuals who never gave up on me. And success for me has this critical dimension. I've got to give some of that back. And without that, I don't view myself as fully successful. And that is why the best opportunities that I've had in life has been to work on behalf of people. From 1993 through 2009, working in the Delaware Children's Department on behalf of kids like you. From 2009 to now, working in the Department of Health and Social Services, where we still do some things for children. We run programs dealing with purchase of care, daycare. We deal with early screening for life, dealing with health care interests of children. We work with folks in the twilight of their lives. We run a division of aging, and so we work with the elderly who need assistance. And then there are lots of people in Delaware, believe it or not, who really need the support that we provide in this department. 
And that is the stuff that gives me a personal sense of fulfillment and a real feeling of success. Before I end, I want to I want to share with you guys one little story dealing with success. How many of you? I'm sorry, there's a question from this young lady. Go ahead. When I went to the Wheatley School on Long Island and uh, and got my, got my first set of classes, I don't think that I saw that I'd ever experienced anything in that first year in '62. Uh, so um, I felt like I wanted to give up. I felt like I wanted to head back to Ten Mile. To people who cared. There were people um, who I left behind in Ten Mile who cared. My parents cared. Those teachers who arranged for me to participate in the program at Lang, school that I left in South Carolina, those are the people who cared. There was a lady who tutored me in writing, a Mrs. Beebe. There was a man who tutored me in mathematics, Mr. Bongazone. <laughs> Mr. Bongazone. And so there were people who cared. There were people who didn't give up on me. And that's the sense that I get in coming to this school. I was looking at some of the, the plaques that you guys have outside, chess champions and academic achievement champions. So that's telling me that y'all got something that's really, really valuable, you have people who really, really care about you. They care that you exhibit courage. They care that you don't fall down. They have high expectations of you. Dr. Thomas L. said, if you're going to be great tomorrow, you've got to be great today. Now, what does that mean, you've got to be great today? That means you've got to be the best that you can be. And you've got to be that in a very honorable way. And that's why I wanted to share this story with you. We could come back to some questions. But how many of you are familiar with the story of David and Goliath? Wow, that's great. All right. Then if you know the story of David and Goliath. Now, who was Goliath? He was the big bully. Goliath was the giant. He, he just tried to boss people around, right? He was like that college president that I uh, had to leave. But, 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 but he, was, he was the bully. And who was David? <laughs> David was the underdog. He was this little shepherd boy, right? How old was David when David took on Goliath? He was 50. But not much older than you guys. Not much older than you guys. David, as you guys pointed out, he was an ordinary shepherd boy. An ordinary shepherd boy. He was an unskilled warrior. But he stood before the giant Goliath because he possessed something that was bigger, better, and better than the ordinary. He possessed the rightness of his cause. This gave David an advantage. Because what he was doing had a greater purpose than being content with the way things were. See, David rushed into danger where others turned and ran from it. And the only weapon that David had were what? The rocks, five ordinary stones. It's what David had, it's his weapon. So if this is so, then the stones selected by the ordinary shepherd were not ordinary at all. From the fact that he was willing to take on the giant, that he was willing to take on Goliath, everything David did, everything he touched, all of his actions, all of his motivations were kissed by divine favor. This kiss of God made these ordinary stones into extraordinary stones. And although David had selected five, he needed only one. He needed only one. So when you do the right things, 
when you listen to and receive the support that's out there, you too become David. You too will have the source to success. So thank you very much for having me. I've enjoyed the time. All right. Thank you, sir. Good morning, scholars. Good morning. I'm Darius Brown. I'm the city councilman for this, this area in the third district. And I just want to thank Principal L, Ms. Yates, and Dr. Smith for being here. Let's thank them for being here this morning. Yeah. I was rushing to get here, so I asked uh, Councilman Wright to uh, welcome you guys here. Did he do a good job welcoming you? Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, as you heard from what Dr. Smith talked about, it's important for you to have a plan of success because here at Thomas Edison, you have a unique opportunity to do something that other schools do not offer and provide for you. And so success matters. There's a quote that I, I have that I live by um, from my time at Dell State and College, and that is, the greatest measure of success is succession. Can somebody say that? The greatest measure? What that means is, it's not what you do, but it's who comes behind you. And so you have to set the bar high. All of you guys as middle school students, in a year or two, you'll be leaving Thomas Edison and you'll be going on to high school. But what you leave here, the academic achievement that you leave here, the standard of excellence that you leave here, uh, the bar being set so high here, uh, allows Thomas Edison to continue their work and continue to be a beacon of light and example around academic excellence here in the third district. 